And as you're being seated, please open in your Bibles to Judges chapter 8. And as you're flipping over to Judges chapter 8, I want to ask you, who was the first king of Israel? Who was the first king of Israel? Now, I asked uh, my great middle child, Hannah, our little theologian this week, that question, who was the first king of Israel? And Hannah rightly answered, God. And now sometimes you think that classic Sunday school answer is incorrect, but she was absolutely correct as she answered that this week, that the first king of Israel was God. And today as we open God's word, we see the kingdom of God, which comes into conflict with the wills of wicked men. As we saw over the previous number of weeks, as we've been looking at the particular judge of Gideon, that sin came into the people of God. They began to worship false gods, but the Lord judged them by sending the Midianites and others over them in order to oppress them and turn their hearts back to him. And they were um, rendered repentant by what God had done. They cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent them a savior by the name of Gideon. And Gideon has been an imperfect man in many ways, but he has been faithful to do what God has called them to do, to deliver them from the hand of the enemy. And last week we saw that the Midianites were completely routed out and destroyed under the hand of their savior, Gideon. Now, as we open God's word, we will see what becomes of the people in light of the victory that they have seen won by the hand of their great God. Please read with me from God's word, beginning in Judges chapter 8, verse 22, and we will go through chapter 9, verse 6. Hear the word of the Lord. It says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us. You and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil." For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels. And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah, and all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more, and the land had rest forty years in the days of Gideon. Jerubbaal, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had seventy sons his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, at Ophrah of the Abizrites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Bareth their god. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of the enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. Now Abimelech, the son of Jerubbaal, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and said to them, and to the whole clan of his mother's family, Say in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, 
for they said, he is our brother. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bareth with Abimelech's hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, 70 men on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. And all the leaders of Shechem came together, and all at Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we open up your scriptures this morning, that we would see the kingdom significance of the events that are happening in this account of sacred scripture. That we would not play games with you, Lord. That we would not relegate you to part of our life. That we would not engage in syncretism where we take a little bit of you and a little bit of the false gods. But Lord, would we be people fully devoted unto you. Lord, in as much as this text this morning reveals sin in our lives, I pray that you would help us to repent of those things quickly, bring them to your throne of mercy and grace, and turn from them. Lord, would this very horrific example of what happened amongst your people serve as a warning to us, and by your grace and through your Son and by your Spirit, would you help us to live accordingly, to learn from their example and by God's grace, not repeat all the same folly. Lord, would you help us in these things? Would you give us understanding? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, for the most part, Gideon as a judge can be described as someone who was fearful but faithful. He was a man with flaws, but up until this point in the narrative, he's generally been seen as a good guy, as a hero, one doing what God had commanded him to do. Now, there was chinks in his armor that was always evident throughout the story of Gideon through the whole of the narrative. He's prone to be afraid. We've seen that on multiple accounts. We've seen where he trusted in sight rather than trusting in faith, which certainly showed a flaw in his character and in his spirituality. And then at the end of the section, we see that he took things very personally. He took personal offense um, that some of his relatives had been destroyed, and he started acting out of that own personal will rather than acting out of God's will and led to the end of the narrative we were in last time, where it was actually the pagan kings who were rightly rebuking him, um, and he received their rebuke and acted accordingly. So he is a good man. He followed the will of the Lord, but he was also a flawed man. And as his life comes to an end, how do we see him respond? Well, in this narrative, we see what flows in Gideon's life and what flows after Gideon's life, after the great victories that he had had for God. And what we will see this morning is really four points as we work through God's word. The first is that the Lord is king, the second, we will see the corrupted spoils. The third, we will see the end of an era. And the last point we will consider is the dethroning of God. Let's begin by considering how the Lord is king in verses 22 and 23. In theology, there are many discussions and debates on how to understand Jesus' reign and his kingdom. Some teach that there are really two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven, which pertains to spiritual things and ecclesiastical church-type things. And then there's the kingdom of this earth, which relates to earthly things, such as politics, civil life, um, just the mundane sort of business that happens here on the earth. They seek to make a division between the sacred and the secular in this life. And as we open God's word today, we will see that making such distinctions is incompatible with biblical revelation. The reign of Christ must not be compartmentalized, put in this corner, but not in this corner. He is either Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. And that comes screaming to our attention in this narrative. What does it say in verses 22 and 23? It says, the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us you and your son and your grandson also, for you saved us from the hand of Midian. 
Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Verse 23 is one of those ones, if you underline things in your Bible, to underline. This is one of the pinnacle texts of all of the book of Judges. It's a great turning point for the people and highlighting the necessity of what will go well for the people when they understand things rightly. But what is it that the crowd is demanding of Gideon after he's now had these victories, after they've been freed from their enemies, the Midianites? What well, says that the voice of the people was calling out to him? Now, one of the things we learn in the book of Judges is that democracy isn't inherently righteous. The will of the people isn't always a good thing, in other words. The mob mentality, the crowd and their desires isn't always something that's going to be honoring to the Lord. And here, the vast majority taken to ballot are voting for something that God would say is unrighteous. They're calling for him to establish himself as king, but not only to set up himself as a king, but him and his offspring after him. They're wanting to set up not just one earthly ruler, but a dynasty of rulers to follow him. And what did they say in this? What was their reasoning for wanting to do this? This is very crucial. Why do they want to set him up as king? They say, for you saved us from the hand of Midian. For you, Gideon, saved us from the hand of Midian. Now, let me ask you, why was the Lord so particular when he sent Gideon and his men into battle to reduce their ranks from many thousands down to 300? Because he wanted to be very clear that it was God and God alone that saved them from the hand of Midian. Yet now, how quickly are the people giving all the praise and glory and honor to their cowardly but faithful leader of Gideon. They're putting their trust not in the Lord, but in a powerful centralized state. What is our glory? What is our power? A centralized government. That is what we need. Now, I noted recently that one of the idols of our age is statism. Well, here we see them worshiping that same false god. Our hope can be in our government. That will work well for us, so they think. But what is Gideon's response to this? He responds incredibly well, despite a lot of Gideon's failures we will look at this morning. His response is 100% correct in what he gives the people. He says, the Lord will rule over you. And here he's reminding the people that they cannot serve two masters. It cannot be that they have God and then they also have this other God that they worship whether it be the state or human power, this sort of thing. But up until this point in Israel's history, their major authority over them, their king over them, their ruler, their savior, has not been any central government. It has been God himself. And here they're saying, they're tipping their toe in the waters of, really, we want to be like the nations around us. Really, we want a man over us who we can see and touch and put our hands on. We want to be like them. This is their first real call for a human king to reign over them. And this is not just them going through the motions of setting up a new form of government. We will see in this text over and over again that installing him as king would have been equivalent to dethroning God. The two cannot coexist. And we see this in 1 Samuel chapter 8 as Saul is set up as king in the narrative between Samuel and God that is very clear that it's not just that they want some new form of government. It's that they're rejecting God himself. And it's the same picture of what we see here happening amongst the people. So what do we get from these first two verses? Well, first we see the Gideon acts on right doctrine. Gideon understands who ought to be the supreme ruler over Israel, and he acts and speaks accordingly. But we also see here that it's not just that he puts down these people. We see that the people's heart is exposed. What do they want? They want a human ruler. They want human glory. They want to trust in that which they can see and touch and feel. And they certainly are quickly forgetting who it was that was their strength, who it was that was their power, who it was that was their glory. 
We must implant verse 23 in our minds because it really captures the whole tension of judges. Who is going to be our ruler? Who is going to be our king? And how will we live in light of how we answer that question? We see that the Lord is king. But then what goes on shortly after Gideon's good, doctrinally correct confession that he makes before the people and turning down the earthly crown? Well, to understand this section, we must understand two key points as we consider the corrupted spoils in verses 24 through 27. The first is, what were the ethics of the spoils of war, and what was the significance of the ephod? Because if we don't grasp those two things, this section, by all means, can just be kind of confusing as to what's going on. So would you read with me from verses 24 through 26 as we consider first, what were the ethics of spoils of war for the people? It says, and Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you, every one of you, give me the earrings from his spoil. All right, notice, he's not just asking for earrings here. These are the earrings of the spoil. In other words, these are the earrings taken from the enemy as they succeeded the Midianites in battle. All right, it says, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them and they spread a cloak, and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold beside the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian and besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels. So what is going on here with these spoils that are being collected by Gideon from the people. The first thing we should ask is, was it wrong for the people to collect the spoils of victory from their fallen enemies? That's where all this gold came from, okay? They slayed all these Midianites and they took from them their gold and brought it back with them. So it's the first question worth asking, is this even ethical gold that they're trading in for this whole endeavor? And it in fact, was. It was ethical for them to collect this. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 20, particularly verse 14, there's a whole list of the ethics of warfare given for the people. And one of them was that as they destroyed their enemies, they were able to take the spoils from the enemies that they were com conquering. So it wasn't wrong that they had acquired this gold from them, but the next question we should ask was, is it morally wrong for the people to be freely giving this gold to Gideon? Now, it's important for us to realize here that what Gideon is not doing as he just turned down the human crown is he's not instilling a tax on the people. It almost reads that way at first glance. You're saying he turns down the crown, now he's taxing all the people and collecting all this money. That's actually not what's happening. In fact, the language is very clear that he is requesting this from the people and that they are freely giving it to him. This is not a tax by threat, but this is actually a free will offering that's being given from the people unto Gideon, their leader. They're willingly turning this gold earrings over to him. Now, what gold did they give? They gave earrings, right? And the text wants to make that very specific because this is a significant detail to what they're being offered up as this free will offering unto Gideon. Well, as we consider spoils, the first thing that should come to our mind in gold is what happened to the people when they were freed from Egypt. As the people were freed from Egypt and leaving their captor, what is it that they got? They received the spoils of gold from the Egyptians and ransacked them on the way out of Egypt. It was part of God's great work of providing for the people. In fact, their very tabernacle and these sorts of things would be constructed in large part with the gold that they took as a spoil from the Egyptians. But they did something else with the gold that they took from Egypt. In fact, they took the earrings that they had stolen from Egypt and used it to create a particular item of worship. Do you remember what that was? Is the golden calf, right? So they took earrings, spoils from Egypt, used those earrings to make this golden calf that they worshiped as the Lord and did debaucherous things before it. And thus, 
from that point forward, the Israelites were commanded that the men were not to wear earrings anymore. And they were commanded not to wear earrings anymore as a reminder of that wicked act that they had done before the golden calf. They don't wear earrings because that was a symbol of this false worship and they weren't to do it anymore. So as these people collected all these golden earrings and spoils of war from the Midianites, they had no practical usage for them. The men could not have worn them and thus they were glad to give them up as an offering. They had this gold earring that they couldn't wear and so they gave it up to Gideon. But the irony is the very reason that they were not to wear earrings was to remind them never to commit the sin of the golden calf again. And yet, what do they do with these earrings that they took that they weren't going to wear to him as a free will offering? They committed idolatry with that very thing. This should be a warning to us that external righteousness without heart transformation will never produce lasting fruit. You might say, oh, I didn't, I didn't wear the earring. But when your heart's still in love with that same idolatry, that external action is of no good. You can clean up your actions for a short while, but unless you love the law, wickedness will quickly ensnare you again, which leads to verse 27. Listen to what happens. It says, and Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah, and all Israel whored after it, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. Now, what is going on with this ephod he makes from these earrings that were offered up to him? Well, we see to understand this, what was the true ephod over Israel? And then what was this corrupted one, this fake one that he made? The true ephod, as we understand it from God's revelation, and some of this is a little mysterious to us, but we have descriptions of it in his word. It was a garment that was to be worn by the high priest and the high priest alone. And this garment had on it 12 different stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And as we discussed at the beginning of Judges, it's understood that they would often consult this garment to understand, for example, which tribe was to go first into battle. As well, contained with this ephod was the Urim and the Thummim. And these were two rocks, and it's understood that these two rocks were used by the high priest in order to settle disputes, similar to like a casting of lots sort of system in there, that God would sovereignly use how these rocks were thrown down to help them decide on significant matters. And this ephod that God commanded for the high priest to war was included in the whole tabernacle system of worship. It wasn't an item of worship unto itself, but an article to be used for the right worship of the one true and living God as a part of the whole tabernacle system. Is that what Gideon is making here? No, he's making something quite different. He's making a fake ephod. The first thing we must realize is that God had not commanded him to do this. There was already an ephod. It wasn't as if the ephod had gone away and they're replacing it now according to the biblical prescriptions that God had given them for this. There was already an ephod, and now they're making a second one for no reason other than they felt it was a good idea. We should be very warned in this. This is one of the reasons why we as a church follow what would be called the regulative principle. And the idea behind that is really simple. In worship, only do what God has commanded you to do. And if you start doing things he hasn't commanded you to do, that is a dangerous proposition. Left many people dead throughout the Bible in various different points. So he makes this fake ephod, which God had commanded him not to do. And rather than unifying the nation with it, now he's actually split the nation because rather than having one central place of worship that all the people gathered to, now they have two different places of worship, one where the tabernacle is and one where this fake ephod has now been set up as a place of worship. Is dividing the nation rather than unifying it. And this ephod, rather than being a component of the whole worship system that God had prescribed, was just one component placed on itself and treated in a very mystical sort of way that certainly would have not been treated in that way as a part of the whole system that God had laid out. So rather being, than being an article being used as God prescribed to worship the one true and living God, now it becomes the article of worship itself. It's a very different thing, isn't it? 
It's a different thing to use something in order to worship God or to worship that thing directly, which is what is happening here. And thus, the act they're engaging in is idolatry. And the wording in the text is very similar, that they are whoring after it. They're committing spiritual adultery with this fake ephod that they had set up, which leads to our third point that is the end of an era in verses 28 through 35. How has the transition between judges in the book of Judges typically happened? Typically what we see as the pattern thus far in Judges is the people are freed from their enemy and then they're given rest in the land for usually about a generation, maybe more. And then once the judge passes away and they've had a generation of rest, the people then begin to slide back into idolatry. They then cry out to the Lord and he raises up a new judge, right? That's been the typical flow and pattern thus far in the book of Judges. But now the people are crying out for a human king amongst themselves. And what we see, rather than the people largely having right standing with God for the rest of the judge's life, we see that before Gideon's life even comes to the end, the people are descending into idolatry. The practices are breaking up in the land, that there's not a season of separation from rebellion, but flowing right from Gideon's own life, things are getting messed up, which leads to what we see in these next few verses. Read from, with me about the end of an era in verses 28 through 32. What does it say? It says, So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more, and the land had rest 40 years in the days of Gideon. Again, pretty typical ending there, and then it would just end at that rest, but that's not how this section ends. What goes on and keeps talking about what was happening, it says, Jerobeal, which that's, remember, the nickname for Gideon, the one who fights against the Baal, all right? Jerubbaal, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, at Ophrah of the Abizrites. And in this section, we see what's different about the end of Gideon's life and the end of his reign from some of the other judges is that he commits compromise after compromise in his life that's going to bear a lot of bad fruit amongst the people. The first and most glaring act of compromise he commits here is that he had many, many wives. It's very clear that this man was a rabid polygamist accumulating for himself 70 sons, which is no small task to do. And we must see from this that from the very beginning, God's design has always been monogamy. This is a clear departure from what God has commanded of the people by taking on these huge sums of wives for himself and going back to the garden, God's intent has always been for marriage to be between one man and one woman, which is here corrupted. But it's not only corrupted with the many, many wives that he accumulates for himself, it also says another layer of depravity into this that he also accumulated for himself many concubines. Now, there's different understandings of what concubines were in the Old Testament. The best, I think, understanding of it is that it was a marriage where the wife stays in her father's house. It's not some want to describe it more as being like a harlot, and that's not really the sense in which we get from studying the Old Testament, but rather it's a wife that they would take but never bring them into their own household. They would stay in their house and they would go visit them some time. And it was a completely corrupt endeavor for the first reason, it's almost always affiliated with polygamy. In that sense, it's a multiple marriage situation and that's certainly ungodly in every scenario. But it's also, again, a corruption of that original garden mandate and that what is a married couple supposed to do? to depart from their father and mother and join together. Well, that never happens in a concubine. They just stay in their father's house um, and they get used um, for relations and then they leave and go back to their own home. There's not the sense of a warm marriage between them and this departing. 
It's certainly a corrupt endeavor that was not honoring to the Lord. And one of the sons of this concubine that Gideon has as part of this compromise, we're told, is named Abimelech. Now, if you've been tracking with us through Judges so far, you've no, caught on to the fact that names are incredibly significant throughout all the book. And this is one of those incredibly crucial names in the book of Judges. He names his son Abimelech. Now, notice it wasn't his concubine wife that named this son. It's very clear to say that Gideon named this son. And what is it that he named him? We, he has over 70 sons. We're not told most of their names. But this one, we are very clear to note that his name was Abimelech. And do you know what that name means? It means, my father is king. So he names his son, my father is king. Does this tell us anything about where the heart of Gideon is at this point? He might have turned down the crown externally, but as he has been led into further depravity, further away from God, further away from what he's called him to do, he now sees himself as he looks in the mirror as royalty. I'm a king, and my son is a king. He named his son, my father is a king. Certainly a bit of a prideful, I think, name to name your son, and an inaccurate one based on the fact that he had turned down the crown. So Gideon rejects the formal crown, but he was acting as if he was a king. In this, we see his heart revealed, that he was acting as if this was truly the case of him. But we see from the scriptures that this man, although he was pretending to be a king, even though he had turned it down, was in no way qualified to be one based on God's word. In Deuteronomy 17, there's a whole list of prescriptions on what it means to be qualified to be a king in this very sort of scenario as it would come up in the life of Israel. And it made very clear that whoever was king was not to do a few things. One is they were not to collect excessive gold for themselves. And the second is that they were not to collect for themselves an excessive number of wives. What is this guy doing? He's posturing himself as a king, but his life is consistent of the two very things that God had said, your king should not do this. He certainly was not qualified for the office that he was pretending to hold. Despite Gideon's many failures, though, we see in this text and from every account that he's still considered counted as righteous. It goes on after he passes away to talk about having respect for him and his family based on the good work he had done for Israel. It says that through the remainder of his life, the people did still have some measure of peace, even though they were engaging in various forms of idolatry, which should be an encouragement to us. This might be in a man of failures and compromises and sins. He seems to genuinely be one of the Lord's righteous. And that's clearly not based on his own work, but based on God's grace for him. So if you are someone who has sinned in grievous ways upon professing Christ, Gideon should be an encouragement to you. We shouldn't model our life after his mistakes, but we should be encouraged by the fact that God was gracious to him despite those mistakes and gracious to the rest of the people during his lifetime. But what happened after he passed? Read with me in verse 33. It says, as soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal beareth their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. Just as they had corrupted the ephod, now they continue down their downward spiral as a people. And it's significant to note that they just go back to worshiping Baal, but the actual Baal here mentioned that the people worshiped after he died is a new form of Baal. We haven't seen that title of Baal yet in the book of Judges, and the na name literally means the Baal of the covenants. Baal Bareth means the Baal of the covenants. Do you know what that is a reference to? That these people are now mixing their religion with the true God, Yahweh, and the worship of Baal. They want the God of the covenant faithfulness, the God of Abraham, whom they were a part, 
but we also want Baal as well. So we'll create Baal Bareth, the Baal of the covenants. This is a corruption. They were mixing the true worship with pagan worship and says that they forgot what God had done for them, which is a striking thing again and again to describe the people's apostasy. It's not merely that they did bad things, that they did wrong worship, but we see time and time again, they forgot. They forgot. They didn't remember what God had done. As much as we can look at that and note that, I wonder how quickly we forget the good works that God has done for us, the testimonies that he's revealed. We're so quick to forget and to run off into foreign things. So what happens with this twisted, synchronistic religion that the people are engaging in after Gideon dies? Well, we see in verse 1 through 6, the dethroning of God himself of chapter 9. If I were to say, who was the first king of Israel, the right answer is God. But if I were to say, who was the first human king in Israel, a lot of people would answer Saul. And there's a sense in which that is right. If we're thinking of the monarchy of Israel, it's not wrong to say Saul is the first king. And he is the first king in the sense that he's the first that God recognized, the first that God helped to install. But there is a sense in which the first human king in Israel is also Abimelech, as we're going to see in this text. Read with me the first six verses of chapter 9. It says, Now Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and said to them, and to the whole clan of his mother's family, say in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of baal Bareth, with in which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, 70 men, on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. And all the leaders of Shechem came together, and all Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. Now, we see that this sin that they had had, it had now led to full-blown apostasy and syncretism amongst the people. And what typically happens as the people run off and start worshiping the Baals or worshiping the false gods is the Lord thus far in Judges has given them over to the hand of a foreign oppressor, whether it's the Midianites or the Canaanites or the Amalekites, right? That's been the typical pattern thus far. But now that this false worship is mixed with the true worship, what does God do? Just as they are trying to breed their, this half-breed religion between paganism and the true worship, now he gives them this half-breed ruler from within, so to speak. This son of a Canaanite and son of an Israelite of who? Of who? The father, one whose father was a king, Abimelech. They are ruled from within. They're ruled not from an outside oppressor, but someone who was of their flesh and of their bones, it says. God raised up an internal ruler to judge them because they've so corrupted their internal religion. It's striking for us that he raises up an internal oppressor based on this. God gives them over in judgment to their sin. What we see in this text is really a picture of what we see in Romans chapter 1, is God gives people over to their various sins. You want a pagan king? I'll give you a pagan king. You want to be ruled by a false religion? Well, I'll put a false religion worshiper over you. You want this? Guess what? You can have it. But as he gives them what they desire, is he giving them a blessing? No, he's given them a curse. The reality is that what they desired was their own demise, and so he hands that to them. This is a great lesson for us. 
So often in our sinful pursuits, we think that our sin will actually produce a blessing. And when God gives it over to us, we realize that it was actually just a curse. God giving it over to them was a sign of his judgment. Sin and rebellion is the judgment we too drink. And symbolically, what the people have done here and what we must see is that they have stripped God from his throne. They no longer want God to rule over them. They want a human king to rule over them, and that is what they got. And what's the fruit of this human king that rules over them? The blood of their own brothers, right? So virtually all of the sons of Gideon are laid bare. Their blood is shed in order that this pagan king from within can rule over them. What should we take from this? What's some conclusions we can draw from this text of Scripture this morning? The first is that worship is inevitable. Secularism is a myth. They thought we can have God, we can have our worship, and we can also have this other sort of human king that's devoid of God. That doesn't work. If they did not realize that it was God or bust, then they were greatly mistaken. There was going to be an object of their worship. It was either going to be Yahweh or it was going to be Baal. It's either going to be the Lord or it's going to be a human king. But there was not going to be any neutrality in that mix. They were going to worship someone. The question is, who was it going to be? And it couldn't be both. They tried that. They just got the rebellion. They were going to not just have an object of worship, they were going to offer sacrifices of worship. The Lord and his tabernacle, or a man-made idol that they had constructed with their own hands, is one or the other. Which are you going to worship? How are you going to worship? How God is prescribed, or what seems right in your own eyes? They're either going to offer blood sacrifices to God, or they were going to have an offering of human sacrifices at the hands of their tyrannical king that they installed. Sacrifices were going to be offered. Blood was going to be shed. The question is, was it going to be what God had desired or what man had desired? Nothing about this account is merely political or circumstantial. It's all theological. Who is your God? Who will you worship? That is the question. And as it was then, so it is now. We will all worship something. As Rush Dooney so well coined, it's not whether, but which. It's not whether you will worship, but which God will you worship is the question. It's not whether you will worship, but which God will you worship. And that is something we must all wrestle with. And we must realize that Christ's lordship must reign over all. He's not content with us joining him to some other form of religion. He's not content with us having him in this part of our life, but ignoring him in this part of our life. It's all or it's nothing. In fact, the very framework for the main spheres of life that we are given are all understood with the lordship of Jesus. So we think about our own families and our own marriages. What is the model for human marriages? It's of a husband leading his wife. And how is he to do that? As Christ leads the church. So thus the lordship of Christ is the model for how we engage in our family relationships with one another. It ought to define our families. I want to ask you, is your family's love for God the sun around which your whole family orbits? Is the love of God the central unifying driver of all that you do in your household? Is glad obedience to his law your house's standard? Or have you other false gods and idols that have crept in and taken his place? There's so many things that can distract us from the lordship of Christ in our household, whether it be sports or hobbies or academic excellence or social status or just mind-numbing entertainment that so many of us give so much of our time to? Are those truly the gods in our house, if we're honest? Now, 
a lot of those things aren't bad in their own place. It's not bad to have sports. It's not bad to have entertainment. It's not bad to have a lot of these things. But when they become gods, when they take the right place of God, they become incredibly destructive. I want you to think through your family's typical Monday. How do you engage on a typical Monday, on a typical week? And as you think about a typical Monday in your household, is Jesus' lordship obvious or not? Is the normal rhythm of your family pointing towards the risen Christ? Is it obvious that he's a value? Is it obvious that he's the central driver in all the other things that happen? Whether it's education or children or your vocation, your communication with one another, how you speak, how you talk. Is Christ's lordship the standard? Is your love for God what's driving the normal flow of an everyday life? Or is it something else? I think it's easy for us in theory to say, yeah, God's the most important thing on, in our home. We can hang that in a poster on the wall. We can say it to one another and feel good about it. But my question is, if you were a fly on the wall in your house, would it be evident by the way you live and act? Is Christ's lordship genuinely reigning over our families? Is Christ's lordship reigning and defining our local church? What is it that Jesus said about the local church? That he is the head and we are the body. Who is to be lord over the local congregation? Is it the members? Is it the pastors? Is it the person who gives the most money? Is it the person who serves the most often? No, it's supposed to be the Lord Jesus Christ in him alone. He is to be Lord of the local church. And thus, we must, as a people seeking to live under his lordship continually, be people of the book. What has he said? And that's how we must live. We must love his revelation more than we love our traditions or preferences. And again, just as hobbies and sports and these other things, are traditions or preferences bad things? Of course not. But once they start getting in the way of what God has spoken, they can quickly become that. Are we willing to submit everything in our body to the lordship of Jesus? We must look to the book and not to the culture around us. Saints, may we ne never fall into worshiping Baal Bareth, where we breed Christianity with the culture, that we take some of what we like and infuse it with what the world loves. That's what the people were engaged in here. May that be a warning to us. May we be continually reformed in these things. Saints, do we honestly believe that we as a church have it all figured out? That there's nothing left in us to conform to Scripture? No aspect of our worship in our life, in our congregation, in our fellowship together to be sanctified? Of course there is. What we'll see is that if we don't continue reforming based on the word of God, we will slide. But you almost never stand still spiritually. If you're not pursuing the Lord, you quickly slide as these people in our text this morning slid into all kinds of whoring, as the text says. What about the lordship of Christ over civil governments? That's certainly a topic that's controversial in our day. But what is it that the text of Scripture ascribes to the risen and ascended Lord Jesus? That he is king of what? Kings, right? And Lord of lords. When human kings try and cause us to sin, who should we follow? Well, we should follow as the apostles say, and we say we must obey God rather than man, right? We have a king above human kings. Do we live like that? Do we understand that deep down in our bones? As we preach to our elected officials, we must call them to bow their knees. As Psalm 2 says, to kiss the sun, lest they perish in the way. Are we willing to give our rulers the truth of what God has spoken, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him? As a nation, may we proclaim that some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Would we live like that? Saints, we live in a representative republic. And if we don't like our rulers, 
We have to look in the mirror. Just as the people elected Abimelech, we have elected our officials, and they represent us pretty well for the most part. The Lord has given us over, and we will reap what we have sown. It's not as if the Lord has brought in some foreign leader to rule over us and oppress us. The rep people oppressing us are the leaders that the population has elected. He's given us over to what we deserve. It's a sign of his judgment. So what should we do? Well, judges is a great model for how God's people should respond when they are disobedient and given over to judgment. We must repent. So often when we think of the problems in our culture, the problems in our home, the problems in our government, all these things, we can very quickly run to all these schemes, right? Well, if just if we run this campaign, if we just get this person on the ballot, if we just do this and this, that's never the answer for removal of God's hand of judgment in the scripture. The answer is always to repent and fall on your face before him and cry out to him and deal with your own sins before the Lord and the things God has placed in our own life. If you don't like the judgment you see around us, then join us in repenting. Join us in looking in the mirror at how we've contributed to the way things are. And as we do this, we must submit all of our lives to the Lordship of Christ. And we must change our thinking to realize that all creation is owed Christ's supreme supremacy. As Kuiper has so well declared, that there's not a square inch of the creation that Christ does not declare mine. In conclusion, I'd ask you to turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to conclude this sermon by re reading Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. Hear what God's Word says about the glory and the honor that is due to our King who's on the throne. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 15. He, this is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we as your people would get a vision for the supremacy the risen Christ has accomplished and is accomplishing through the work of your spirit here in this earth. God, would we see the glory that is due to the Son, And Lord, I pray that we would take the text that we just considered this morning in Judges as a grave warning that we as your people would be content and glad and joyful to worship you and you alone. That we as your people would gladly live under your lordship because we know that for Christ your yoke is easy, your burden is light, Lord. But the judgment that comes from our sin and rebellion is a heavy enslaver. Lord, would we see your law as a delight out of love for you? Lord, if there's any corner of our lives that we're keeping from your lordship, drive us to repent. Judge us if necessary to make us ready for repentance. But Lord, I pray that you would reign supreme in this congregation. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.